May 15, 1943. In the U.S., members of the American Federation of Musicians have been on strike for higher royalties since August 1st last year. The last union recording made was with Harry James and his orchestra with Helen Forrest on vocals singing I've Heard That Song Before. It's been the number one song on the U.S. Billboard list since March 6th, this year, 1943, and doesn't seem to be going away anytime soon. The song playing again and again in the occupied lands this week is also a tune we've heard before. It is the sound of tyranny played to the rhythm of bombs in the same key as the hissing of gas at the distorted tempo of a funeral march played too fast. This week, the Grim Reaper and his grisly band once again plays their tune from Western Europe to China. Here's a word from the Time Ghost Army. Never forget. Never give up. Never surrender. Join the Time Ghost Army. This is War Against Humanity, a series of World War II in real time. I'm Spartacus Olsen. Last week, German occupational murderous tactics in Europe continued and continued to spread. The United Nations allies increased their bombing of German civilian targets and hit French civilians in a botched attempt to bomb a railway junction in Rouen. The uprising inside the Warsaw Ghetto gained more international attention, but inside the ghetto, the Jews are outnumbered, outgunned, with German troops and Soviet citizen volunteers gaining ever more ground. Nonetheless, the resistance of the ghetto inhabitants has dealt a blow to the image of firm control by the Nazis, and this week, their leader makes a move to preserve his bases for absolute power. On May 10, the Enabling Act of 1933 is set to expire. That act gave German Führer Adolf Hitler a wealth of dictatorial powers, but only for a limited time. Hitler extended it in 1937 and 1939, and now again in 1943, but this time indefinitely. The law allows Hitler to legislate without consent of the Reichstag, lending Hitler's dictatorship a thin veneer of legitimacy. The Reichstag is in itself only a curtain for Hitler's absolute dictatorship anyway. Germany is a one-party state, so although there has been elections, all representatives are Nazis. The last election was eight years ago, and the last time the Reichstag convened was over a year ago, and it will not convene again during the war. The 10-year anniversary of the 1933 Enabling Act is also the 10-year anniversary of massive book burnings throughout Germany as Hitler seized power. Books on communism, socialism, liberalism, sexuality, early postmodernism, books written in French and English languages, and books by Jewish authors like Albert Einstein were burnt. In memory of this aggression on human knowledge and culture, the 300 largest libraries in the United States fly their flags at half-mast throughout this week. Meanwhile, in Germany, on this anniversary, it is not books, but cities that are burning. The Battle of the Ruhr, the massive bombing campaign to lay waste to German factories and homes, continues. On May 12, the heaviest air raid to date, in all of human history, that is, is carried out on the German city of Duisburg. It's the fourth time that the city is hit by the RAF. The previous sorties failed in great part to hit the city, but this time around, the de Havilland mosquitoes dropping targeting flares are precisely on target. In their wake, 572 aircraft, including 238 Lancaster, 142 Halifax, and 112 Wellington heavy bombers, drop 1,600 tons of bombs on the historic city center and the Rhine port area. By comparison, the largest German raids of the London Blitz were less than half that size on a significantly bigger city. 1,596 buildings are totally destroyed, and a great many more are severely damaged, including four Tyson steel factories. 59% of all homes are destroyed or badly damaged, 96,000 are homeless, and 273 people are killed. 
Bomber Command considers this raid a great success, so much so that Duisburg is scrapped from the target list for the Battle of the Ruhr for the foreseeable future. The damage is thought to be so massive that it will take months for the city to recover its industrial capacity. It looks like the United Nations Alliance hopes to cripple the Nazi war economy, to halt it, is coming true. But the effect is not quite what Bomber Command thinks. Not even in the Ruhr this month. Production is not stopped, but they do put a halt to the staggering growth of output that the Reichsminister for War and Armaments Production, Albert Speer, has achieved since early 1942. Speer is keeping the production from collapsing by a brutal reorganization of production. Areas in the immediate vicinity of industry are being evacuated from civilians. Workers, both slave labor and German employed workers, are now housed in camps and subject to military-style discipline. Factories are being moved underground en masse, and a constant stream of new slaves replaces those being worked to death or killed in air raids. For over a year, production output has increased by 5.5% per month on average. The attack on Duisburg does, however, mark an abrupt halt to that increase. To be clear, that is not the same as halting production, and the current German armaments output is quite impressive, especially in view of how the war is going for them. And while the British deliver death by bomb loads, the German Nazis are killing by train loads. From across Europe, train after train carrying Jews continue to arrive at the Nazis' murderous labor camps and extermination factories in Eastern Europe. The latest and largest of 17 transports with 4,500 Jewish people from the Greek city of Thessaloniki and Bulgarian Thrace now arrives in Auschwitz-Birkenau. Tens of thousands of the 56,000 Thessaloniki Jews have already been transported to Birkenau, where a great many have been gassed on arrival. Now that the vast majority of Polish Jews have been murdered, it is Jews from Southeast Europe and West European Jews who are being taken to the remaining extermination factories created for Operation Reinhardt last year. Bevšec has shut down. Treblinka is still being used to kill the Warsaw Ghetto Jews, but at Sobibor, men, women, and children from France and the Netherlands make up most of the victims. They arrive from transit camps like Drancy in France and Westerbork in Netherlands. Four transports full of victims from Drancy have already been murdered, and on May 11, the 11th transport from Vesterbork arrives. Its passengers are promptly fed into the gas chambers. Towards the end of the massive murder spree of the Jews from Poland, word of what was ahead had reached the entire Polish Jewish community. As a result, the lies and subterfuge to lull the victims into a false feeling of safety had ceased to work. The camp guards had to use more and more violence to force their human cargo into the death chambers. The French and Dutch, who now arrive, have not heard of their fate ahead of time. One of the Jews in the work camp at Sobibor, Leon Feldenhelder, describes... These transports were treated entirely differently. They arrived in passenger trains. The platform workers of the Bahnhof Kommando helped them carry their baggage to a special barrack near the station. The deception was carried on to such an extent that they were given tickets in order to reclaim their baggage. The square was a special table with writing instruments to write letters. They were ordered by the SS men to write that they were in Vlodava and to ask the recipients to send them letters to Vlodava. Sometimes answers to these letters were indeed sent. These letters had a double purpose, to make the recipients believe that the deportation did not mean liquidation and to reveal the addresses of the families of the deported. In the spring of 1943, 34,000 Jews from Vesterborg are taken to Sobibor, out of which only 19 will survive the war. 
And while the Nazis staged theatrics to subdue any resistance from their unarmed victims in other places, they are continuing to use military force to quell armed resistance. May 15, a coalition of German, Italian, Croatian, and Bulgarian armies launch a new offensive to eliminate partisan resistance in Yugoslavia. Since the failed attempt to wipe out the partisans in Operation Weiss, or White, in February and March, the Germans have been preparing a new offensive, Operation Schwarz, Operation Black. The partisans remain in Herzegovina and Montenegro, where they are in combat with the Serbian-led Chetnik forces. The communist partisans have the upper hand and have driven back the Chetniks and their Italian allies. Now they threaten the Axis positions in the Montenegrin capital Podorica, as well as in Kosovo and Albania. While the Germans allied with the Chetniks during Operation Weiss, this time around Hitler wants both Tito's partisans and the Chetniks wiped out. The Italians oppose the disarmament and destruction of their Chetnik allies. In the end, the Italians depend on the Germans to maintain their joint occupation and agree to comply with the Führer's orders. Commander of German forces Rudolf Lüthers has received reinforcements. The 1st Mountain Division and parts of the Brandenburg and 104th Jäger Divisions have grown the Axis coalition to about 127,000 troops and 300 airplanes. The Axis forces have taken up positions in Foza to the west, Plievlia to the north, Kolasin to the east, and Nixik to the south. The plan is to surround the partisans and Chetniks into a cauldron, tighten the cauldron, and eliminate them. On May 15, the Germans start to slowly advance towards the mountains of the Dormitur Massive in northwestern Montenegro. The First day is spent mostly disarming Chetnik auxiliaries, but as the cauldron slowly but surely starts to close, they aim to annihilate any partisans inside. If we judge by any of their behavior during Operation White, the Axis forces will likely not care if what they strike at are armed combatants or innocent civilians. This is not the only new offensive that carries with it renewed atrocities. As you have seen in in these episodes in the last weeks, the Japanese have launched a new offensive in China. On May 9, the Japanese capture parts of Hunan province. Their three alls policy, kill all, burn all, and loot all, now comes into play once again as they proceed along the Yangtze River. The town of Changjiao, they indiscriminately go after anyone caught in the town, raping women from little girls to grandmothers, torturing for the simple pleasure of it, and killing men, women, and children with their bare hands, knives, swords, and guns. The sadistic orgy soon litters the streets and houses with the dead and dying. Three days and nights of constant massacre that leaves 30,000 Chinese civilians murdered and countless more scarred for life. And while that sadistic revel comes to an end, an orgy of fire and blood continues in the Warsaw Ghetto. Despite that a huge part of the ghetto has now been burnt to the ground, against all odds, some cells continue to resist from underground cellars and bunkers. German patrols continue going block to block, burning homes and shooting at whoever or whatever moves, every hour, every night, every day. German commander Jürgen Stropp writes about his men's methodical approach. The longer the resistance lasted, the tougher the men of the Waffen-SS police and Wehrmacht became. They fulfilled their duty indefatigably and in faithful comradeship and stood together as models and examples of soldiers. Their duty hours often lasted from early morning until late at night. At night, search patrols with rags wound round their feet remained at the heels of the Jews and gave them no respite. Not infrequently, they caught and killed Jews who used the night hours for supplementing their stores from abandoned dugouts and for contacting neighboring groups or exchanging news with them. By the end of the week, the vast majority of the roughly 60,000 Jews in the Warsaw Ghetto have been captured or killed. 
The dead include the wife and eldest son of Shmuel Ziegelboim, one of the two Jewish members of the Polish government in exile who've been trying to move the United Nations into action to do something to save at least some of the Jews. Ziegelboim's youngest son, Joseph, has escaped and will now fight in the Polish resistance, eventually rising to one of its leaders. On May 11, when Ziegelboim learns of the nearing end of the stand in the ghetto, he writes a note to the Polish president in exile, Vladislav Raskiewicz, and prime minister in exile, Vladislav Sikorski. It is a message he wants them to convey to the world. Mr. President, Mr. Prime Minister, I'm taking the liberty of addressing to you, sirs, these my last words. And through you, to the Polish government and the people of Poland, and to the governments and people of the Allies, and to the conscience of the whole world. The latest news that has reached us from Poland makes it clear, beyond any doubt, that the Germans are now murdering the last remnants of the Jews in Poland with unbridled cruelty. Behind the walls of the ghetto, the last act of this tragedy is now being played out. Responsibility for the crime of the murder of the whole Jewish nationality in Poland rests, first of all, on those who are carrying it out. But indirectly, it falls also upon the whole of humanity, on the people of the Allied nations and on their governments, who up to this day have not taken any real steps to halt this crime. By looking on passively upon this murder of defenseless millions, tortured children, women, and men, they have become partners to the responsibility. I am obliged to state that although the Polish government contributed largely to the arousing of public opinion in the world, it still did not do enough. It did not do anything that was not routine, that might have been appropriate to the dimensions of the tragedy taking place in Poland. Of close to 3.5 million Polish Jews and about 700,000 Jews who have been deported to Poland from other countries, there were, according to the official figures of the Bund transmitted by the representative of the government, only 300,000 still alive in April of this year. And the murder continues without end. I cannot continue to live and to be silent while the remnants of Polish Jewry, whose representative I am, are being murdered. My comrades in the Warsaw Ghetto fell with arms in their hands in the last heroic battle. I was not permitted to fall like them, together with them, but I belong with them to their mass grave. By my death, I wish to give expression to my most profound protest against the inaction in which the world watches and permits the destruction of the Jewish people. I know that there is no great value to the life of a man, especially today. But since I did not succeed in achieving it in my lifetime, perhaps I shall be able, by my death, to contribute to the arousing from lethargy of those who could and must act in order that even now, Perhaps at the last moment, the handful of Polish Jews who are still alive can be saved from certain destruction. My life belongs to the Jewish people of Poland, and therefore I hand it over to them now. I yearn that the remnants that has remained of the millions of Polish Jews may live to see liberation together with the Polish masses, and that it shall be permitted to breathe freely in Poland and in a world of freedom and socialistic justice in compensation for the inhuman suffering and torture inflicted on them. And I believe that such a Poland will arise and such a world will come about. I am certain that the President and the Prime Minister will send out these words of mine to all those whom they are addressed, and that the Polish government will embark immediately on diplomatic action and explanation of the situation in order to save the living remnant of the Polish Jews from destruction. I take leave of you with greetings from everybody and from everything that was dear to me and that I loved. The next morning, he kills himself in his London apartment. 
In accordance with his wishes, but contrary to Jewish custom, he is cremated so that he can join the millions who have met the same fate. He can then no longer be buried in Jewish hallowed ground. Instead, his ashes end up in a shed near the Golden Green Jewish Cemetery and are forgotten. In 1959, they will be found by his son Joseph and brought to Mount Carmel Cemetery in Ridgewood, New York, where he now rests. Never forget. <laughs> 